how Nikon came back from disaster, the brink of death. I'm trying to be dramatic like you. We are going to follow Nikon from their massive success to a strategic mistake that almost completely bankrupted the company and bring it back to the Nikon Z8, which we find pretty amazing. You think it was one decision that they made that almost ruined them. Yeah, we'll talk about what that is. But first, let's talk about our sponsor, Squarespace. Whether you need your own website, portfolio, store, you can make it happen with Squarespace, and it's so easy. If you can drag and drop and have 10 or 15 minutes, you can make your own website. Go check it out for free, no credit card needed. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. First, let's quickly recap Nikon's history. We have an entire podcast covering Nikon from the start of the company all the way through the modern era. All right, give me the 30-second version, Tony. We're all busy people here. In the 1920s, they were making knockoff lenses for companies that were prominent at the time, like Leica, mostly German companies. And then in the 1930s and 40s, well, Canon started making cameras, so they were making lenses for Canon, as well as lenses that were compatible with other lens mounts that existed at the time. And then World War II. Two happened and they were working for the Japanese Navy, making optics. In the 1950s was really boom time as uh, all the American soldiers were occupying Japan and buying cameras and they started focusing really on professional cameras and lenses. They produced the most popular F-mount SLR and they overtook Leica as the preferred camera for professionals. Then in the 1980s, Canon made some leaps in image stabilization and autofocus and really took the number one spot and Nikon held on to the number two spot for decades. And then in the 2000s, we switched into the digital era. Not too much changed about the cameras except we swapped film for a digital sensor. Okay, so that brings us up to about the present day. Um, so we want to talk about how they fell from holding number two for so long to falling into the number three spot and really scaring a lot of people into thinking they might just disappear. I, I think it all comes down to one strategic mistake that they made. Okay. But I have to get a little nerdy in order to describe what this mistake was. We have to understand the technology that was around at the time that they made this decision. Yeah, and since the 50s, the most popular camera format for professionals had been the SLR, the single lens reflex, and reflex here means mirror. And when we talk about mirrorless cameras, which all modern cameras are, they are described in the context of missing that mirror. It's weird to describe a technology by what it is not, yeah. but that's how important the mirror has been for 70 years of camera technology. Now, if you look in a DSLR, you will see that it has a 45 degree angled mirror. That mirror bounces light up to your eye so you can see through the lens optically but what people don't realize is that mirror is a is like a semi-transparent mirror it bounces light up to your eye but it also bounces light down the other direction to another sensor that is not the image capture sensor not the big sensor but a little sensor and this little sensor that is really the eyes of the camera that is how the camera sees the world and that is how SLRs autofocus, that is how they do their metering. And for things like Nikon's 3D tracking in their SLRs, that is how they follow subjects around. That is how they do auto white balance because those sensors, off the imaging sensor, th that sensor can see color. It's a pretty smart sensor that does all the hard work. That's important to understand because that sensor had to go away along with the mirror when we switched from SLR architectures to mirrorless architectures. So basically we went from having something that worked very well, a camera with a mirror with two sensors, an imaging sensor and the sensor that was like the brains of the camera, to people saying, let's just do away with it and make one sensor, which means you have to develop a bunch of new technology. Right. Everything had to be moved onto the sensor instead of off sensor. It all had to be, 70 years of work had to be scrapped and you had to start over from scratch. It was not a small change. But we saw a real breakthrough in 2013. When we bought our own Canon 70D to review it, we were absolutely blown away. I'm going to compare the ability of the different cameras to focus on a foreground subject and then on a background subject. This is a common technique in videography, whether you're demonstrating a product or so now we're going to do the same test with the Canon 70D and just touch the camera on the touch screen display. 
it instantly focuses on the camera. Uh, now I'll go ahead and switch back to my face. <laughs> How amazing is that? Focus on a book behind me. There you go, it just switches automatically. For the first time ever, we could turn on live view, which is to light up the back screen. Instead of using the viewfinder, which everybody did 100% of the time with SLRs, you could light up the back screen and it worked. The yeah. metering worked. It could identify faces and lock onto them. Everything that we take for granted with modern mirrorless cameras, we saw for the first time. And I don't think that it registered how important it was because in 2013, there weren't even a lot of people on YouTube. A lot of people were not doing video and people weren't thinking about video in their DSLRs like they are now. We were because we were filming these videos and we had a designated camera person where we had to stop and make sure everything was in focus for every single shot. Right. And everything was manual focused. Everything was manual focused, yeah. Um, and so when this came out, we realized, well, we could film ourselves and actually get some things in focus. It was a huge breakthrough. Through, and it was a technology they called dual pixel autofocus. And that means for every pixel on the camera's imaging sensor, there were two little pixels that could see the world from a slightly different angle, and Canon could use that to autofocus, nice and smooth. So and, Canon was a little ahead of the game. Right. Before people even realized they were ahead of the game because no one could foresee that this was going to make mirrorless cameras more advanced than a DSLR. Except perhaps Canon who had been clearly preparing for this for years and launched it, you know, a decade ago. Yeah. Four years after that big dual pixel autofocus breakthrough, Nikon launched one of our favorite cameras of all time, the D850 in 2017. I called it the greatest DSLR ever made. In summary, the D850 is our favorite DSLR of all time. We both agreed it was the best camera ever for wildlife. Yeah. And our review about it was so passionate. Nikon asked if they could quote us in their advertising. We declined. We thought it might make us seem biased. But that's how much we loved the D850. We really loved it. Those were the good old days, weren't it? Wasn't it, Nikon? <laughs> so we took a charity trip to Puerto Rico, and I needed to shoot stills and video. Mm -hmm. And the D850 had like 4K video, which was super high tech at the time. But it, it did absolutely terrible for video. It was always great for stills. Yes. But yeah. I, the video was absolutely appalling. Well, you were dreaming of a hybrid camera that did not yet exist, really. Right. Well, Canon was making pretty good hybrid cameras, yeah. but I kind of assumed that the Nikon would be like that, so I just grabbed it and mm -hmm. went in kind of a hurry. And everything live view with Nikon was terrible. Everything with the viewfinder was great. The root of the issue goes back to that piece of technology where you're reading the images and the autofocus on two separate sensors. So when you were taking video, it wasn't working as well as it could have. Right. You take video, the mirror flips out of the way, and everything has to be handled on sensor. And Nikon didn't have that on sensor technology. So the autofocus was terrible. The subject detection was non-existent. The auto white balance was awful. And the metering was really bad, too. All those things were terrible because even though Canon introduced it four years ago, Nikon had not invested anything in that tech. So this is where you think their pivotal mistake was. Yes, Canon invested in on-sensor technology. Nikon did nothing. And then in 2017, slightly after the D850 announcement, Sony announced the Sony A9. Much I was amazed by how many shots camera. I had in focus. Yeah, it seems like like all of them. Like yeah. it just seems to grab focus as good as the best focusing cameras in the world. Which Sony had been developing full frame mirrorless cameras for a while. And they had a severe defect. The autofocusing was terrible. Yeah. I didn't, we didn't like any of them. We never recommended them. The autofocusing was always For sports and wildlife, the, the focusing was not as good as a DSLR. Right. And in fact, it was so much worse. We thought it would be way longer before they ever caught up. We eventually learned that they had been banking their technology. But then shortly thereafter, in the beginning of 2018, Sony launched the Sony a7 III, which turned the camera industry upside down because this had basically the A9's autofocus. Like it could see your eye and lock onto it. It could follow fast moving subjects and the camera was $2,000. And so many professional portrait, wedding photographers, sports photographers switched from Nikon and Canon to Sony that it demanded a response from Canon and Nikon who were going to lose their shirts. And that response was both of those companies launching their own mirrorless platforms, the Canon R platform and the Nikon Z platform. 
And we went to New York City for the launch of the Nikon Z6 and Z7. And how did you feel about that launch? Uh, it's a memory I've tried to repress. The Nikon Z7. Is it Z camera to have? <laughs> Focusing. This is the part that kept me up at night, and this is the reason I will not be reading comments over the weekend. It was rough. It was just rough. They promised me my D850 in a mirrorless form, and that was not my experience. A lot of hunting. I had Tony walk towards me, use continuous focusing mode, missed a lot of shots which is something that doesn't happen to me with the D850. Most of the shots. Most of the shots. I was really disappointed and I hate to have to be critical in a review. I know that the engineers worked really hard. I'm so excited that Nikon is moving in this direction and I hope this can all be fixed with firmware updates, but I, I can't just not report that this was a really big problem for me. Yeah, we'd had our expectations set by that A9 and A7 Mark III from Sony. We thought it was gonna be like that and it was not, it was it was bad and it was uncomfortable to be was, looking at the engineers who developed it. They brought them it out. Works, it works so poorly. that It works so poorly that we put off publishing a review for like two weeks because we were too uncomfortable. Yeah, then we made the saddest review ever and then just got beat up in the press. <laughs> right, because not everybody was quite as brutally honest at the time. Okay. But people who have used the Z6 and Z7 now won't understand because Nikon released a lot of firmware updates they got that. after that initial yeah. review. But I want to remind people, those initial cameras did not have eye detection at all. The metering was absolutely unreliable. It would over and under expose shots all the time so that you always had to use fully manual exposure. They did not have proper auto white balance, which had been a feature in digital cameras for about, about 20 years. You had to manually switch between indoor and outdoor auto white balance. And even then, you often got completely blue or green or orange pictures. They only launched consumer lenses and bodies with single card slots and F1.8 primes, but they had them at professional prices, which means we had to compare them against cameras like the D850 or the A7 III, which were way ahead of them. Shortly thereafter, we saw a lot of prominent photographers switch away from Nikon very publicly. Like we had Jared Poland, who had always been a Nikon shooter, ditched oh, them. Yeah. Matt Granger prominently sold all of his Nikon gear. And you, who were such an enthusiastic D850 shooter, you switched over to Sony at that point. Yeah. And Nikon in sales dropped from second to third behind Sony. Yeah. And Nikon would continue to fall, especially looking at just mirrorless sales, to the point where their sales could not be tracked. They were just well behind Olympus and Panasonic and Fuji. It was a scary time. Yeah, they were pretty much off the map in the only area of growth. And then in 2020, they reported extraordinary losses, which was in the press everywhere. Yeah, it is just a very boring accounting term. But mm -hmm. it sounds very exciting, so it got massive amounts of coverage. And they kind of blamed the pandemic. Even yeah, though this is May was, of 2020, and the yeah. pandemic started really, it hit, hit the U.S. in March. Um, but they had been losing money for, like, unprofitable for more than a year. And they continued to get bad press because of that, including we made a video called Nikon is Dying, But It's Not Too Late. But Nikon did react appropriately. But I think in a way that made people nervous because they knew what was going on. They assessed the situation and they had a round of layoffs. They laid off 700 people. Um, they lost $183 million in Q2. Their camera and lens sales were down like 29 to 70%, but they reacted by doing these rounds of layoffs. Then they laid off 2,000 more people. I think they shut down manufacturing in Thailand. You know, of course we always feel bad when there's layoffs. It's scary. It makes people think the company's not doing well, but it also means the company is figuring out a way to be profitable again. This was Nikon's rock bottom. Yeah. But it gets better from here. We hope it's the rock bottom. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna first thank our sponsor and then we're going to tell you about the rebirth and rise of Nikon to the point now where we have the Nikon Z8 in our hands and we like it better than the competition for a lot of things. Yeah. You need your own website. Your social media presences are not enough. You cannot control it. You could have some billionaire come in and just buy that whole social media platform. Not that that's happened or anything, but that could happen. You should get your own domain name, your own website that you own that, that competitors cannot take out ads on. 
This all gets started at squarespace.com slash Chelsea. You get a completely free trial. Set up the website however you want it. You can have a store. You can take appointments from clients. You can show off your still or video reels. Make yourself look fantastic at squarespace.com slash Chelsea. And when you love it, the coupon code Chelsea will get you 10% off your long-term account. Thank you, Squarespace. All right, let's get back into it because this just gets better and better. We're out of the sad period. We're into the phoenix is being reborn from the ashes. Yeah. In December 2021, Nikon came out with the Z9, which was really exciting because they were still developing their technology and it was over-spec'd, under-priced, which was promising. They were making a compelling argument that we should all give them another chance. They heavily controlled the marketing. We weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> no, we really had to fight for months to get our hands on a camera. And I don't blame you. We're loud mouths. Take, you know, if you make a camera that's crappy, keep us out of it. I don't want to be a part of it. <laughs> and they also had limited availability. And they had improved so much on the Z9 that people were happy with them. When Not we, us? No. When we tested it, we still felt like it was behind the competition, but it was still the best Nikon mirrorless camera. Yes. We could see they had made massive improvements. progress. And I think that limited availability was smart. They didn't put many copies out there. Yeah. Because they kept working on the software. And I don't think they really wanted that many people to get their hands on version 1.0 of the Nikon Z9, but they had a, a software-based commitment to continue to improving it and updating it. Yeah. And they did that aggressively. And when we say they controlled the marketing, we mean externally the message was, we just leapfrogged Sony and Canon. And they got a lot of uh, YouTubers and people in the media to sort of mirror that. I've learned you can get people to say anything if you just say it's true. Yeah. Which is a great or horrible lesson, depending on who has it. It is funny because we did side-by-side -side reviews with Nikon, one person working internally with Nikon off the record, and an external Nikon enthusiast, and they both said, oh no, it's behind Canon and Sony, it's the best Nikon, but it doesn't... It, yeah. And that was the message that we did externally. And while Nikon's external message was we leapfrogged the competition, internally, they listened to our criticisms and our reviews and continue to aggressively address it. Yeah, not it. us specifically, but I mean like, we mean the community of reviewers. I think us specifically, because oh, I really? always read the firmware update release notes, and they seemed to very specifically address whatever complaints that we had had, like focusing on birds and tracking birds far away, was the oh. subject of several different consecutive firmware updates. And mm -hmm. we committed to testing every, just about every one of these firmware updates, and we saw consistent and gradual improvements. Yeah, then Nikon's manager of user experience planning, Kenji Oishi, came out and finally basically said, I will summarize, that the Z9 was updated so much that version one versus now are just completely different cameras. I agree. Yeah. The software updates were so extreme. So it's really interesting. I do think that when they came out with the Z9, they're like, let's put it out and just keep working on it until it is what we want it to be. Because you have to keep coming out with cameras to keep your existing customer base. I understand that. They came out with this camera knowing that they'd be playing catch up for a little while. And then this past May, just last month, they launched the Nikon Z8, which is a Z9, except the modern Z9 with all of the updates. And yeah, they dropped the price point. They dropped the price point, but they also listened to what people wanted and they made it like the D850. I think it's finally the mirrorless D850 they were promising way back in 2017, 18. Yeah. I see, I wish they'd sent me this one because I, 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 it would have been glowing. Uh, yeah, it could have been a beautiful thing. They could have time traveled uh, back five years. I may be a B word, but I'm a fair one. <laughs> but they did so many nice things and they listened to the things that people wanted. They, what they loved in the D850, they brought it to a mirrorless camera. Uh, and oh, I'm just so happy for them. Like, it's good. Yeah. It's and actually good. They have an interesting strategy there. It is a flagship camera. It is a Z9, which yeah. is $5,500 and intended to compete against the Sony A1. But they price it at under $4,000. Well, like $3,999. Yeah. But that means you're not comparing it to the Sony Alpha 1. You're comparing it to the Canon R5 and the Sony A7R5. And that's a pretty brilliant move. Yeah. Because in an awful lot of ways, it's a better camera than those. Like it is twice the frames per second of the Sony, which is a huge difference. Yeah. And 
we are not done with our review, but our testing so far, like, what do you think? I think it's good. It, it hangs with the R5. I think it had some things better than the R5. Yeah, there the, are ways it leapfrogs the competition. And also, what I really love about it, which I've always loved about Nikon, is it kept those Nikon ergonomics. It's a little bit chunkier. It's not a super small mirrorless mm -hmm. camera. But if you're shooting wildlife and sports, you want a grip that's a little bit meatier. Spoiler alert, Nikon is back. They are like one of the competition now. We do not have to cringe as we review the camera. I can just be like, oh, I love the Z8. I really like I using the Z8. I feel so good. I feel like people think we want to create controversy. We want competition. We want great cameras because we love photography. Yeah, but also I want to just love what we're reviewing because it makes it easy because when we don't like something, we have to back it up with all these tests. It's so boring and tedious. And yeah. it's, 10 times more work when something doesn't work. Then you have to email the company and say, am I doing this right? And they send you back feedback and they say, did you try this? And you have to try it and say, I did yeah. and it still doesn't work. And then they'll say, let me talk to so-and-so and get back to you. It's so much harder for us <laughs> to make a bad review. Yeah. We love good reviews. <laughs> but I do also want to think about the future. Nikon is leading this segment now. Are they going to stay ahead? Because here's the thing about competition. When you get ahead, your competition watches what you do and they respond. Yeah, and it's more difficult to innovate. Right. Because you have to do it first and then everyone can look at what you did and catch up. Mm -hmm. Canon is already responding. Like they have dropped their R5 pricing pretty aggressively. And so the Nikon Z9 is 3999 and the R5 is now about $3,200, but they're throwing in a whole bunch of extra stuff too. This is why we like competition. It's good for you. You're going to get it, a bargain is. when they, they fight. <laughs> also, I know Canon is working on their quad pixel AF an upgrade from their dual pixel dual AF. Dual to quad? What will you think, think of? I think we'll see it on their R1, which will be a pretty direct flagship competitor that they've been holding back. And I think they're holding it back because they're going to leapfrog everybody. I think, I think the R1 is going to shake everything up. I Again, see switching. What else do you think is coming? Well, Sony is extremely aggressive with competition. Like, they are the most competitive company, definitely. They have a new dual layer sensor that they just launched in the Xperia, which promises to add a stop of dynamic range, which is a pretty big deal. It's a big deal. We also think that they're working on Android-based cameras, which should drastically improve workflow. And they have their new AI chipset, which they're still working on the software for. But when they release the A1 Mark II or other proper competitors to the Z8, um, it could be a pretty big leap. And the big advantages that the Z8 has over the competition are in the frames per second and in the readout speed of the sensor. And those are both based on properties of that sensor itself. But the trick is Sony makes the sensor. Sony doesn't tend to give the very best tech away. And if they did, it wouldn't be exclusive to Nikon. Yeah. So Sony is definitely capable of making a camera that matches or exceeds what is now a three-year-old sensor. And I expect that response. Yeah. And so Nikon is going to have a difficult time staying in the lead since they're dependent on other companies to make their But sense. we're seeing they're fighting to stay in the ring. Yeah. And that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, I also have to ask, where is Nikon's video response? Because if you look at Canon, Sony, Panasonic, they all have proper cinema lines, cinema-oriented bodies, cinema lenses, and their stills lines. Uh, have a lot of hybrid properties, like flip-forward screens. Canon, all their cameras have flip-forward screens now. Um, Sony, the Sony a 7 r V has a tilting flipping thing. That's the Z8 competitor. The Z8 is the only competitor that does not have a flip screen, which means it's not really a proper hybrid camera. You can use it for video. It can be good for that, but you can't use it for vlogging or putting yourself on camera, which a lot of prominent photographers need to do that nowadays. I know it's something people have always scoffed at, but that is where we are. People are creating their own content and filming themselves all of the time. And so I think Nikon really has to start interviewing content creators and finding out what they want Yeah. so that they can make cameras that appeal to those people. So Nikon is still focusing on stills, which is going to please a lot of people. But from a more broad market perspective, the number right here is 85 to 95% of new camera buyers need video capabilities. And Nikon has kind of been ignoring that market. They've introduced some like vlogging stuff, but there's nothing at the high end and it's not quite matching what the competition is doing. So yeah. in the video segment, they still seem to be behind. And the future is definitely video over stills, right? Yes. In summary, 
I am so relieved to see Nikon really back on top in some ways mm -hmm. and certainly hanging tight with the competition. I still feel a little anxiety about the future, but I think the Z8 is an amazing camera. It warms my heart. <laughs> <laughs> what do you all think? Are you excited about the Z8? If you were previously a Nikon shooter, are you feeling like this is going to make you stay in the brand or are you still thinking of looking somewhere else? Let us know. We like to hear your thoughts. And of course, we have to tell you about Squarespace, not only because they're a sponsor, but because we love them. You have bought four Squarespaces. Yeah, and most people should have not just one Squarespace, but multiple Squarespace. You know, if you do uh, wedding and boudoir photography and commercial photography, you probably need separate brands for each of those. Get started today at squarespace.com slash Chelsea. They have everything you need and you can try it completely free. Only when you love it, after your free trial, the coupon code CHELSEA can get you 10% off. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. It's called the Picture This Photography Podcast. You can subscribe to the playlist on YouTube or go anywhere podcasts are available and subscribe there. And thanks for your support. Bye.